Hello. Hey guys. Hi. It is me again. No surprise. The name of the channel is actually my name. I'm not in Denmark anymore. I'm in Kenya now. So, so everything we're about to share, everything we're about to talk about, we essentially sort of know this already between each other because we just lived it the last year and something. <laughs> so the main points, as for in continuation from the previous video, are. Uh, my eye has recovered, not as end, unfortunately. So it's just at the the minimum before it's illegal for you to be driving, which is kind of sad because that's the easiest way for me to get around is just by driving. But we'll see how this goes, hoping it stays like this, if not recovers to how it was previously. Anyway, the good things like that I got out of this whole process or experience would be that in the end, I was able to get uh, financial support for my healthcare. Well, specifically healthcare related to MS. So not so much, um, I can just go see a GP whenever I feel like, no, it has to be specific to MS care. Which would be great if it had been everything. Also, it's limited. It's only for one year. So from the 1st of July, 2021 until, I guess, the 1st of July, 2022. So I'm doing as much as I can to, I suppose, be prepared to be able to pay for it myself or at least find an alternative because right now um oh yeah sorry i forgot to say the authority got in contact with a, a very good doctor one of the best neurologists that we have in, that, sorry that are there in kenya so apparently he is affiliated with the distributors of i forgot the name of the company i think it's rosh anyway the company that owns okribus so as such he's able to get okribus here now it's great. All this is fantastic. Um, he's also a good neurologist yeah, and, and good person. Like he seems friendly and all of this. The hitch is the cost of the previous. So it's, it's okay. It's fine. It's great that it's being paid for at least this time in October and next year in April, but then next October, I'll have to sort that out on my own or find an alternative. It's as expensive as, um, oh, 720,000 Kenya shillings per session, which is twice a year. So let's say to make it seem more, make it simpler. It's about 1.5 million a year, which is a lot. Cause that's the price of a, a decent, maybe used car. Anyway, that's the price of a car. Every time I get medication, <laughs> at least for the year, price of a car. So that's not a joke anyway, but, but it's also, I mean, it's just for now until, yeah, up until next year, Ju July. So I'm trying to figure out if I can get something else instead of a previous or have some kind of um, financial support from NHIF. Alternatively, my neurologist also told me that because of his talk, talks, sorry, because of his talks with um, the company supplying with papers, they want to supply it at a subsidized rate. So maybe instead of, I don't know, 1.4 per year, it would be 300,000. Which, but that's not that's not a joke. It's like more or less within reach if you really work like okay, it's more reachable, more attainable than one point four million. Do you have a do you have a ballpark yes. estimate of how much one point four million Kenyan shillings is in like other people's money? So in euros, that's ten thousand huh? Oh, okay. Yeah, ten eleven thousand euros per year. Mm -hmm. It's about fourteen thousand no, ten, eleven thousand dollars a year. Anyway, so yeah, it's that amount per year, not a joke. It's it's solidly something like um like a, a roughly a, a third of what people would be earning in a mm -hmm. entry level job. Like not a not a non educationally required position, but mm -hmm. like let's say a I'm job. a teacher and so I will earn before taxes yeah, roughly uh, three times that amount. So after taxes, it'll be like half my income. And you've been insured because Kenya is one of those places that we here in Denmark, we can't imagine what it's like to live like that. But one of those places where you don't have free health care, so to speak. So you do have medical insurance, but having a medical insurance for like, I suppose, general 
ailments is not the same as having like a more expensive insurance that protects you against stuff Where's like everything? autoimmune deficiencies. Slight correction, so not on any insurance scheme or plan or anything, mm -hmm. but there is a national health, oh god, <laughs> anyway it's called the NHIF, apparently that exists and it's worth looking into. It wasn't mm -hmm. really that well established before I left, I mean before I went to Denmark in 2018. There wasn't really much to look for and I think even during the process of um, having applied for asylum as I said to help me get like proof to show how when you've tried approaching insurance companies the biggest um, news we get the, they kick you out really quickly because they will say pre-existing conditions are not covered and then the ones that don't say that will say we don't cover MS it's not covered in our funding which is important I'm sorry impossible but it's just unfortunate that it's not covered most of the time. So yeah, yeah. that's why I heard that there's an NHIF scheme. And also, I forgot to say, my neurologist did, in the last meeting, um, he did talk about how one of the patients is now on a medication, not the same as Ocrevus, but it's on a different medication um, that is being funded by this NHIF scheme. And he's mentally on Ocrevus though. So even the neurologist said that he did write a very strong word, a letter to NHIF about this, but then they said that's all they can do right now. They only give him this alternative. It's called Rituximab. It's medication for rheumatoid arthritis. There is some science that... now. Hmm? Okay, there's some science that says that rheumatoid arthritis and... MS. And MS uh, are like kind of linked in some way. I don't say necessarily linked, it's more so like they're both chronic illnesses that mm -hmm. have the same dysfunction, I think, of the T-cell or something along these lines. Yeah, so I think because of that reason, the medication for that level, that type of arthritis is meds that target the T-cells, the same way Ocrevus is targeting the T-cells, except it's not with the same efficacy, same strength as Ocrevus. Okay. That's really a lot of me paraphrasing. <laughs> that sort of makes sense. I think Understandable. Yeah, good enough. From the Home Return Agency, sorry, Danish Refugee Council. They have supported me to start a business. So in this case, it's going to be um, an online shoe business to start off. And then hopefully it'll grow into something bigger than just selling shoes. Maybe it'll start with like bags and such. But now it's just school, school shoes. Yeah, school, <laughs> school shoes. Shoes for young children. All right. So what you were just talking about with the shoe shop, and what I was going to ask about was something to do with how the transition was between being in Denmark and then being back in Kenya, because you hadn't really visited Kenya while you were staying in Denmark. You'd been away for a number of years, and you hadn't seen your family, you hadn't seen your pets, you hadn't seen anyone. I, except for maybe like on video calls and such. Mm -hmm. So what I was wondering was like, was, was it a big transitional period? Was it something that you had to get used to? Definitely. For starters, so the whole city, Nairobi, that is, Nairobi is the whole country really, okay, but I'd say Nairobi because I live here. Nairobi has changed a lot. So on a basic level, as I'm going around in cabs and such, Sometimes I'm not too sure where I am, but I'm really sure I know the road, but it's the trees are so tall. Like there's just so much change in the city. And then as far as um, things like family, it's slightly different only because my other sister isn't here. So we're four kids in the family. I'm the oldest, my sister, well, one of the sisters, um, brother and baby sister. So my sister, one is one after me. She now lives in the state somewhere. I would say in Texas. I'm not, I'm sure it's not Texas, but anyway, somewhere in the States. But she's not here right now. So it's different that that she's not here. It's kind of different. It's weird. Sort of, sort of. But I'm happy for her and her life there. Um, other things are like my parents. Like it's not nice, but you notice that they've aged. So I've noticed my parents have aged as well. And they tend to be, they seem more busy than before. Mm -hmm. and, like they have a lot of things going on and they've always had a lot of things going on which is one of the reasons why you live in like a pretty nice place and they had the money to send their kids off to different countries around the world but mm -hmm. of course with age comes this kind of extra pressure 
from mm-hmm. having several businesses going at once. But I was wondering because you said that your your sister and that maybe you don't want to get into it and that's fine. But you said your sister lives in Texas or something like that. Have you stayed in touch? Have you tried to keep up with what she's doing? We sort of haven't been in touch for some time. I mm-hmm. remember, I think the last time we spoke must have been April or something. Um, maybe, probably, see how I did, I'm not been too sure, but I'm sure it was this year, definitely, when I was still in Denmark. So it may have been April or February this year. Mm-hmm. So we haven't really been... So um, something like nine months ago. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. That's more or less how our relationship has been. It's getting better now, because before it would have been... Honestly, probably not have known. But it's, it's fine, I mean... Family stuff. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And that's why I'm also saying you, like, you don't have to get into it. Um, but I was just thinking that since you arrived back in Nairobi, you've mm-hmm. been meeting up with family, you've been meeting up with old friends. The thing that's missing there right now, as you're putting it yourself, is that you used to live in this house with your sister. Mm-hmm. And now your sister isn't here, and that's kind of weird. Do you have any plans in future to maybe visit? or have her come visit in Nairobi? Like, is there any kind of long-term plan for that? It could just be a short visit, but it's like, if I'm going to the States anyway, I might go to that particular state. Nothing's been probably planned out or like discussed, but you could say on a very basic level, my mom wanted us to travel there. She wants my brother especially to go there for his university studies. Um, Mm -hmm. Then she did talk about me looking for work in the States. And as for me traveling, I think in terms of a holiday, I don't think that's possible for me at the moment. And maybe for some time, because of how I'm trying to figure out how to save money for the medication that I need. But last week, spoke, actually, we spoke recently. She called my mom uh, maybe a week ago or something. And I I'd asked her at the time about when she possibly might be coming home again. And she said she's not too sure. She's been really busy and she's also trying to save up. So she said maybe, huge maybe, December 2022. Mm-hmm. I said, okay, I mean, that will do for now. It's good enough for now, yeah. Yeah, so in something like a year from now, mm-hmm. which is a, a decent time frame. I have a lot of stuff that I'm scheduling for something like a year from now. So I know that feeling, mm-hmm. but I can only imagine that coming back to Nairobi, at least in terms of the winter experience, is vastly preferable to staying in Denmark. I'm, I'm, I'm living it right now. I'm living it. Um, you can't see out my window, but there's really nothing to see. It's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I thought you were saying that um, I prefer being in Denmark for winter over being here during this month, these months when it's cold. No, I was, I was saying Nairobi would be vastly preferable to Denmark in winter time. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, right now today it's kind of cloudy, it's raining, so I guess it's the closest thing. It's not even that cold though. Hmm. It's like 22, 20 degrees. It's just that it's cloudy and it's been raining and drizzling most of the day. But the temperature here is fantastic. You can walk outside the t-shirt and walk outside the t-shirt and saw it today. I mean, I have a hoodie, but yeah, that beats like gloves and being, um, avoiding getting frostbites. Yeah, th- this is better. Any day, <laughs> any time, any day, this is better. And it's nice being but with I would, family. I would always much prefer bundling up in order to not get hit by sunshine. To mm-hmm. having to bundle up to not get all the heat in my body sucked out of me. Like, this is <laughs> what we have to do whenever we leave the house. Yeah. And, and, and it might be it might be a cool look, but it sucks. <laughs> and you, you, get, you get outside and you're like, mm-hmm. I want to not be outside anymore because I feel like, I did, like I'm being attacked. Mm-hmm. I remember the first time I learned about the physics of, of heat. Mm-hmm. Coldness isn't really like a, a physical thing. You only have degrees of heat. Mm-hmm. So when, when we're talking about like Celsius, you can have something at 20 degrees Celsius, you can have something at 18 degrees Celsius, and it will like equal out to 19 degrees when the two things touch. Mm-hmm. Because the heat is moving from the hotter thing into the colder thing. And I'm the hotter thing mm-hmm. when I'm outside in the cold. 
So all of my heat wants to move out and, and, and heat up the world, and it's already being heated up by everything else. So it doesn't need me to help heat it up. Yep, heat is being stored. It, it mm -hmm. feels like it's being sucked out of me, but it's actually my very generous nature as an, <laughs> an endotherm, like a, a person who produces their own body heat, mm -hmm. that I am willingly passing my heat off into the world. And I don't like it. Mm. Understandably. It's, it's something that I'm, my body does because it, it feels like it must, but I am not really in agreement. So we bundle up mm -hmm. to keep from, from giving our heat away and lots and lots to and an, lots an, an, an uncaring world. <laughs> Unappreciative world. When you do travel here, you can enjoy it. it. Sorry? I, I do think it appreciates it. I just don't mm. think it really cares. I don't think the, the world dislikes getting warmer. Mm. I just don't think it really cares either way. Mm. Yeah, but I think it really likes it here. Aside from because of the weather, the cost of things here are tremendously cheaper than houses in Denmark. But I went for, for some tests and as such, it's maybe six kilometers or something away. And I paid about in Kenya shillings for 50. Had I been in Denmark, it would be absurd. I'd never go anywhere by the cab in Denmark unless it's an emergency. Because it's just so expensive. Like, fine, I paid 50 krona. That's like 26, sorry, 26 Kenya shillings. Sorry, 26 krona. So come on to 150 Kenya shillings. In Denmark, the cab fare starts at like, I think 50 or 60. So just for entering the cab, yeah. you owe 50. Which is equivalent of, um, do this quickly. 50 corona is equivalent of, oh wow, 860. Yeah, that's a lot. That's almost as much as um, if you're trying to get to the airport, because typically you pay something like, I think 1200 Kenya shillings, which is about, yeah, about 70 Danish corona is enough for me to take a cab from here to the airport. But had I been in Denmark, I'd probably pay something like, I think like, Five, six thousand. Yeah, I probably paid like three hundred Danish krona, which is five thousand shillings, gets the airport from here, and that's like the cheapest equivalent. Like calculations I've done real quickly. Like it's it's upset. And, that, and how how far was that? I'd have to just double check because I'm not too sure. Because I found a price calculator for for taxis in Denmark, so I can hmm. I can okay, give you actual numbers. Okay, so that's about 21.2 kilometers. It'll cost 1,200 Kenya shillings uh, and what is that, like 300 Danish krona? 21 kilometers mm -hmm. in a taxi and you're saying it's to the airport, so that would be in uh, 7,170 shilling. That's the best example of how things are more expensive in Denmark than in Kenya. And, okay, yeah, so that's one thing, that's your transport, then there's with food mm -hmm. beef here is so cheap it's really cheap i haven't bought beef myself but i know it to be the cheapest one i know i think cheese might cost about the same it's definitely less here but it costs about the same but coffee here costs bad of what it costs in denmark like to buy the beans and like pre-roasted beans and ground coffee and such it's a lot cheaper here given even imported yeah even imported Granted, we're not very far from the people that are importing. Like, if you think about it, we get coffee from Ethiopia, from Rwanda, from, I mean, from our own country. Um, mm -hmm. I think those are the majority. And I'm not too sure. This is me paraphrasing. But I think majority of the, the coffee that we have is Kenyan coffee. And then maybe Ethiopian from Rwanda. This is the most popular. You basically ones. just have to roll it down the mountain and, and put it in the <laughs> coffee pot. Yeah, throw it at the back of the pickup, bring it to Nairobi. My dad did that recently. He went to the farm. Um, his parents have a coffee farm, a small coffee farm. He went to the farm and actually have it harvested beans. Yeah, mm -hmm. so he picked out some beans, brought them home. And I was very fascinated, like, oh, this is what beans look like. They're sort of like light in color and such. Anyway, I was about to roast them, actually. Then he interrupted and he's like, oh, watch out, those are special. I, I don't, don't, don't touch them. Don't, don't cook them. Just leave them as they are. I'll, I'll get some more from the shamba, the farm, and you can roast those ones. These are a bit special. I want to just hang on to them and look at them every day when I'm leaving the house. I'm like, oh, okay, sure. I won't, I won't roast them then. So yeah, so I think- They're the, the beans number one million 
that his parents ever produced. So for all maybe you that's know. why they're special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They counted all of them and they found that this batch, the the number one million is in here. Mm -hmm. Food, transport, and generally other things are just cheaper here. I'm trying to think of other things that aren't. Well, some places in terms of restaurants, it can still be as expensive as it is in Denmark. Yeah. Which is fine, honestly. Are. Like yeah, which is also okay. the the reason that we tend to compare ourselves to other places where food seems cheaper is because some countries have a eating out culture and some places have any have an eating in culture. And in the places where they have an eating out culture, mm -hmm. usually the people who make the food and who serve the food and clean up after you after you're done eating make pennies. Like they they are underpaid and they survive off of tips. We don't have a tipping culture in Denmark because we don't have an eating out culture. I think those two are very like fairly related. We also have pretty solid workers' rights culture. So like whenever I come across a company in Denmark that doesn't have I don't know what it's actually called in English, but we have something called an Oinskomst, which is basically a like if I were to, to directly translate it, it's not a not a union. Uh, so it's like it's, the individual's worth. No, the okay, union, no. the worker, and the employer mm -hmm. sit down and have a meeting where they mm -hmm. decide on rules. And there's no law that says they must do this. It's just something that has occurred since if the employer gets free reigns to do whatever they want the worker gets exploited if the uh, worker is given like free reign to do whatever they want the employer gets exploited is the basic general terms mm -hmm. so what you do is you have the union as the middleman but it like in the employee's favor because the employer of course has the most power since they are the owners so what they do is they have an agreement and that agreement and it's probably better to call it an agreement um i i, I think i translated it to a, a, a get a longing or a getting along a getting along so getting like along. yeah it come or what means basically means to get along mm -hmm. so uh, if there is a workplace that doesn't have an audience comes or mm -hmm. a, a getting along, um, I tend not to do business there because it genu generally it will mean that they have uh, unfair working conditions for the employees. There is no reason for the employer to not have a getting along if if it's not to somehow exploit their workers, and they will usually make up for like poor hours and um, lack of training, lack of safety, lack of whatever, by then allowing the employees to uh, receive tips from customers. So that's like a red flag whenever I go out and I, I go to a place and they ask for tips or they mm -hmm. expect tips because we just don't do that here. Then on the other hand, food is really expensive. Like eating out is expensive. Mm -hmm. Because the the people who work at a restaurant need to be paid for their labor and for their know their know how and their diligence with cleaning and making sure that everything is as good as it can possibly be. Mm -hmm. So you you tend to pay a lot when you go out, and it's an occasion when you go out. Yeah. So I can't remember is is tipping something that's basically mandatory in Nairobi? Oh no, it's it's not mandatory. It's courteous to do, but it's not like you must. You must always tip people or it's bad or you look like a bad person. No, it's just more like a, a nice thing to do. It's a charity or it's something that you do if you feel like, oh, this service was extraordinary. I am yeah. going to, to tip this waiter because he or she smiled at me when they said, have a nice meal. That pretty much up to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So that makes sense that like eating out in Kenya might not be as cheap as mm -hmm. some people might expect from I'm, I'm taking the, um, the, the the guise of an of an ignorant foreigner mm -hmm. thinking oh in Africa 
<laughs> Things must be cheap. <laughs> no, not even. But again, depending where you go. Yeah, I understand. But it's it's troublesome because I mm -hmm. you've talked about before how beef is inexpensive in Kenya, but chicken is expensive. Beef is I'd say if this can put like a step system, maybe beef is here, chicken is here, and then maybe pork. Yeah, pork is a bit more than chicken, and then well pork and goat meat are on the same. Yeah. And then maybe lamb is up here. Then at the very top I think is like salmon and other types of um I would say fishy dishes, fishy meats, fish. Fancy imported fish, because you don't you don't rear salmon in in Kenya. It's I like too hot. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think salmon so. Salmon enjoy cold. I think of the other fish that we have, like Nile perch. Uh, well, tilapia is everywhere, so tilapia also is, is maybe just above yeah. chicken and beef, or maybe the same level as chicken. Uh, anyway, there are also Tilapia is one of like fish. the cheapest fish in the world. I've seen uh, like this documentary on factory farming mm -hmm. of fish. And where they talk about how tilapia are like the most farmed fish in the world, uh, mm -hmm. followed by salmon. Mm -hmm. Because you can farm them in anything, basically. Mm -hmm. And I saw these places, I think it was in Vietnam, mm -hmm. where they had like these lakes, and it just looks like a lake. Mm -hmm. And they have a raft, and the raft is pushed out into the middle of the lake. And then you have three or four people with big, like, hefty bags that they cut open and spill out feed into the lake. And mm -hmm. as they spill out this feed, the water starts boiling. It's tons and tons of fish, all kind of like swimming into the, the raft at the same time, just mm -hmm. fighting to get to the food. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was horrifying to look at, because you're just thinking, this water is really murky and, and brown looking. Mm. That's probably because it's filthy with, like, fish That one fails. Yeah. It's really it terrible. doesn't seem like they have any kind of circulation going or filtration or whatever. They probably grab a bag of food, throw it into the water, grab mm. a bag of oh. antibiotics. Oh. So they grab <laughs> a bag of food and they throw it in the water and they grab a bag of antibiotics and they throw it in the water. And the Keep fish go legs. nom 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 nom. And then you pull them out of the water somehow, probably with a hose, mm -hmm. like a, a big tube that you suck it out of okay, the water. Yeah. And, yeah. And then you cut their heads off and you ship them around the world. Essentially, because it's that easy with tilapia. My dad tried to do, not farming, but really like keeping fish as pets and then they became food. Well, not okay. Not all of them became food, it's just that he got some tilapia, brought them home. And kept them and had this idea about ha having a, a pond at the back of the house and possibly growing tilapia there and selling them to to the markets which are and such yeah but like having was... a like a, a small garden and selling mm -hmm. produce from your garden but with yeah. fish but yeah exactly now it's fish the first time he actually brought the tilapia home it's got by the way he had this type of fish apparently it's a shark but it's so tiny it's like it's really small. Anyway, and he attacked the tilapia, and the tilapia couldn't survive. So my dad took up the tilapia, my sister and him cut it open, and then they cooked it, and they ate it. And I was like, you guys, that's your pet. You eat your pet. And he's like, no, it's not my pet. It's it's a fish. It's food. I'm like, but was it it? Your pet? And I was like, yeah, but yeah, it's tilapia. It's food. Okay, it's food. Okay, okay, sure. Mm -hmm. You have fish and you look at the fish and you sit around and you see the fish swimming around and they, they kind of swimming, the swimming around and they, they bump into each other and they go like at each other. And then every once in a while you feed them and they get all excited and they flop around. And in that sense, you kind of develop a little bit of a relationship with those fish. Do you notice that some have habits and others are very bland and do basically whatever? So I can understand where you're coming from when you're saying like you shouldn't eat your tilapia pet, but at the same time, uh, people have been keeping farm animals. 
That's true. And it's incredibly odd, to be honest. Because even, like, for example, in our family, around Christmas time, we go to shag slash our country slash the farm, family farm. And then tradition is that a goat would be slaughtered and it would be roasted. So you'd have roast goat meat. And mm-hmm. it's not nice to be there when it's happening. Well, sorry, when the goat is being slaughtered or the sheep is being slaughtered. Because they hang it upside down so it can bleed out. But I mean, it's dead, but mm-hmm. still, it's still like, oh my God, this is dead. And it's bleeding into a bucket. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, depending on the, on the technique, sometimes, um, like, I don't know if this is strictly mm-hmm. something that's done in, in like, uh, Islamic countries, because there is the halal version mm-hmm. of slaughtering a beast, where you have to cut them from ear to ear around the neck while the animal is still alive Mm. and i don't know if they get around it in some places by saying okay well the animal is stunned like we used a a stunning method like we hit them over the head with a with a hammer or something to kind of knock them out Mm -hmm. because then the heart keeps pumping and as such you can you can cut the throat and the blood comes out and the animal isn't like fearing that it's dying Mm. because that's my biggest problem with slaughtering an animal is that if you have to kill something else in order to eat it it should be quick Mm. and it should be better than would happen naturally because in nature no animals die peacefully and and like feeling content and happy and (laughs) surrounded by family and friends Mm -hmm. no Death is always brutal, it is always inhumane, and it is always painful. And if it's not painful, it's it's like still a terrible way to go, no matter how you go. So the best thing we can do as human beings with our like higher level of cognizance is saying, we know that this sucks, we can feel pain, and we know that other things feel pain. Mm-hmm. Pain is a bad thing. So let's eliminate that part of the process. And then we've, over time, developed a sen- like a sense of these animals probably also have emotions besides having just oh something hurts I am hungry feelings. Uh, they also have emotions. We know that mammals can feel uh, grief when they see a like a dead animal of the same species. There are animals who show kindness to other animals even outside their own species. Mm-hmm. I saw a video earlier today of a, of a, like a, a bull. Mm-hmm. I can't, I couldn't really tell the species. It was not like a, a regular dairy cow, but it was something like a buffalo that flipped over a tortoise that was on its back. Aww. So it saw the tortoise on its back next to a tree and it went over to the tortoise and was like going down and then using its, its horns, it flipped the tortoise over and then it walked away so i'm only like i can imagine that there is some sense in these animals that oh that probably sucks i'll help oh i was i'm getting sidetracked by my sidetrack i was just talking about how we know that animals can feel fear and Mm. pain but they can both feel like physical and emotional fear they can they can feel like oh the world is ending a dog that that hears fireworks will like start to shiver and, and try to find a place to hide or it will mm-hmm. it will try to defend the house by by barking at the windows mm-hmm. so in the same sense if you know that a, a pig is as smart or smarter than a dog you can also imagine that a pig being taken away from the other pigs and and killed in some way makes the mm. other pigs freak out because they know that something there is, is happening that's bad. There's a predator. It's killing one of my friends or family members. Mm. Maybe it's going to kill me next. Mm. Panic, panic, panic. Meanwhile, sense. the pig that's, that's currently in the process of dying is going, this is bad. This sucks. I don't like this at all. I'm, I'm mm. dying. I think mm. this is really bad. The predator got me. Mm-hmm. So having a humane way of killing animals, if you have to kill the animal, I think is a really important part of our duty to be the higher animals in this world. Yeah, I completely agree. 
So at the bottom we have beef, followed by chicken, followed by pork, pork,、mm-hmm. followed by goat and sheep. Yep. Followed by expensive fish.、Mm-hmm. All right. So here it goes like this, and it really depends on the quality of beef because、mm-hmm. you have more or less pricey cuts of meat. But at the bottom, you have chicken.、Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then, above chicken, you have、uh, pork. We have a lot of pork. It's a huge export. We produce a lot of pork meat in Denmark, but it's still more expensive than chicken. I think it's because because of something like the cost of of producing pork per kilo is higher. But I don't know.、Mm-hmm. But you have pork. Then on like above that you have beef, and then in between pork and beef is where a lot of stuff kind of sits because the most expensive cuts of beef become like really expensive. You have something that costs several, several like let's say the the quote I gave for the taxi ride earlier was seven thousand Kenyan shilling.、Mm-hmm. I don't think that would be something like five and a half thousand. Mm-hmm. For a kilo of like pretty good beef,、okay. premium cut, not maybe like from a a premium type of cattle. It's not like、mm-hmm. we're talking Kobe、uh, meat, like the Wagyu beef from Japan is、mm-hmm. like a famous example of when, yeah, beef transcends beef and it becomes like a specialty item. Like、mm-hmm. this is just like the best part of the cow. Mm-hmm. Would be something like five and a half thousand Kenyan shilling per kilo,、uh, five and a half to six thousand.、Mm-hmm. Then you go to, like in between those points, you have、uh, veal. You have, which is also beef, but it's baby beef. Just call it veal. Baby beef. Then you have mutton, which is sheep. And is goat just called goat, or is that also called mutton? No, mutton is sheep. So what do you call goat? Just goat. Just goat. Goat means. Okay, so yeah, goat and sheep, I suppose, would be somewhere in between, and that's mostly because goat、mm-hmm. is something that you basically cannot find at a supermarket in Denmark. You can find lamb occasionally、mm-hmm. around Easter. We basically only ever have goat meat if it's like an an imported thing, and it's part of like, oh, let's do. Ethnic night where we invite <laughs> friends over to have some kind of special kinds of food, and you can get it, of course, at、uh, restaurants that have a special, like, national theme.、Mm-hmm. So I assume that if you went to a, like a Moroccan restaurant or a Greek restaurant or something, there might be some more more sheep and goat stuff like there. Like maybe the Greek one would be mostly lamb.、Mm-hmm. Then we have fancy fish,、uh, shellfish, shrimp. Oysters, all that kind of stuff, way up there.、Mm. Fish is really expensive. It's like twice as much pork as you as you get for the same price of fish, and that that's even like boring white fish. And all white fish is basically boring and and similar. That will still be expensive. The least expensive kinds of fish you can get, I think, apart from white fish, is something like herring, because herring is a very very flavorful fish. It's not easy, I think, to process. So usually you buy the herring just like as the whole fish, maybe without the head. But you have to debone it yourself.、And、if you want the skin off, you also have to take the skin off yourself. Not off yourself, but <laughs> off the fish yourself.、Yes. Mm-hmm. Herring is a is a big deal. It used to be a really big deal in Denmark. It used to be like one of the country's main sources of income was、mm. catching. Herring and selling it because we are not a, a big country by landmass,、mm-hmm. and even back when we used to own Norway, Norway is not a big agricultural country, and this was before、uh, oil became a factor in how much money countries had. So it was all about how much coastal area do you have, and Denmark has a ton of coastal area for its size,、mm-hmm. so we could fish. Basically, anywhere you lived in Denmark, you weren't further from the coast than something like 50 kilometers. 90% of people live 
like less than 20 kilometers from the sea. But nowadays, herring has gone out of style. It's too fatty. It's too flavorful. Mm. So people eat salmon instead because the salmon is basically like the chicken nugget of the sea. <laughs> you can eat it, and it's it's mm. always the same flavor. It's always the same texture, mm. and it's it's not very fish flavored, which mm. people like. But before salmon became a big trend in Japan, tuna was the the king of sushi. Mm. So like everyone had tuna for everything. And then salmon came along and became a huge import because they don't have a lot of salmon in or around Japan. So they imported from places like Canada, uh, Alaska and Norway, especially Norway. They got a lot of salmon and now salmon is the most popular fish type for sushi everywhere. Mm. Mostly because it has very little flavor. Yeah, and the texture is nice at the same time. All right. So, well, sure. we had some, some good conversations because what we were basically setting out to do with this video and i know that you've been overthinking this quite a bit because you do uh and and that's probably also why it's been a while since your last video you've been wanting to have a lot to talk about and i think we've had a lot to talk about uh, but what we wanted to do was basically just kind of put something out there so that you know, once you've unscrewed the lid once, it's easier to get it off the second time. And in this case, I think we've been just trying to unscrew the lid. We can go into like heavier subjects at some other point. Um, today, we've been talking about food and we've been talking about like the differences between Denmark and Kenya, which is probably not like the most hard hitting uh, topics ever discussed on a podcast video hybrid kind of thing but i'm i'm glad to have been a part of it i'm glad to have uh, been remedial in getting something out there even if it's been kind of loose yeah it's been nice having you here thank you it's a huge encouragement to have something out on the channel as well so i do appreciate your presence here <clears throat> And so we're able to put words together, well, talk about these topics in a much more fluid way. So, big thank you for that. Now, in closing, I just want to say a big thank you to all the individuals that reached out to me. I'm doing a lot better. I'm eating better. Eating avocados that are huge and cheap. <laughs> so I'm glad for that. Just wanted to say that I am the person in Denmark who has been uh, closely working together with Washera in the a couple of years that she has known me, we've been trying to get um, her set up with some kind of medical assistance and like figuring out how the deportation was going to happen. And mm -hmm. throughout the time when she was waiting to be either like sentenced to deportation or the deportation actually taking place, she stayed at my place um, incognito in order to not have to stay at this horrible like detention center, basically. Just something I greatly appreciate. That changed everything. I'm not too sure how I'd, how I'd be had I not had that place to escape to. So big thank you to you. Happy to do it. Thank you guys for watching. We will see you on the next one. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. I waved. And cut. <laughs>